Shabbat shalom, amen. Praise God. Let's reverence Father Yahweh. Most holy and righteous Father Yahweh, this is your servant, Kohan Kohilath Hawkins, coming to you in unity with your men here, Father, being in unity with your holy body of priests, being seasoned servants of your last days and under witness, our great teacher, our pastor and overseer, the great Kohan Yisrael Abel Hawkins, and through and by the authority of our righteous high priest, our honorable high priest, Yeshua Messiah. Great Father, we thank you again for allowing us to be here at your great house to continue to learn your ways, Father Yahweh, and be a part of your family. We pray and ask that you will guard us, protect us, continue to inspire us daily, Father Yahweh, so that we can be a part of this body of believers forever. We do a hob you. We thank you for all of these things and pray and ask these things through and by the authority of Yeshua, our Messiah. Hallelujah, Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. Men, please be seated. Okay, we're going to be in chapter, well, this is the uh, fifth book of Israel, uh, chapter 28. The kingdom of priests will bring peace to the universe, number 14. Okay, the kingdom of priests will bring peace to the universe, number 14. The whole goal for mankind is found in the first two chapters of Genesis. Okay. The whole goal for mankind is found in the first two chapters of Genesis. So Pastor kind of, uh, he kind of changed gears on us a little bit here. So the first... <clears throat> The first part, we're going to be talking about a specific subject, the sickness and diseases, and then we're going to get into Genesis. Okay, so I'm going to start in verse two here. So just so you know, we are going to change gears just a little bit, but you'll see why pastor presented the information the way that he did. So in verse two, he says, I hope you understand, and I got to start with these already. He says, I hope you understand the reason I'm having Kahanya Didia bring these articles on the wars and sickness. It's to show you that the whole world is not following Yahweh's way. They're not receiving the blessings he promised to Israel. They're not receiving the blessings that Israel once had when they went into part of the promised land. They are available and they're going to be taught by Yahweh. And Yahweh is allowing this sickness, disease and war to go on. They all go together. They go with the sickness of the mind and body. And through that, uncontrolled lust is brought forth from unclean food and from sinful activities. Right now, I think every baby who was born in the, whole, in the world has a form of syphilis. It's mutated that much in the last 50 years. So he's starting off with the, you know, by expounding on the, the sickness, the disease, and the wars. OK, and think about that right there, because, again, the title is that the goal for mankind is found in the first two chapters of Genesis. OK, so he wants to talk about why we were created, but he starts off by showing what the problem is. OK, the problem is the lifestyle of mankind, the choices that we make by following the, the, the teachings that are outside the instructions that's given by Yahweh's house. In verse six here, it says, he says, remember, remember the dream I had that I told you about that I was so distraught because, because I couldn't get everyone to understand certain things. In the dream, it said, take it back to the beginning and tie the end back to the beginning. I started some sermons. I started some sermons then to do this. This was before the feast and I wanted to get back to them. I want to make everyone understand the beginning and the end and how Yahweh actually gives us the goal. He sets a goal for us there. In actual fact, it's in the first two chapters of Genesis. If you really keep this in mind as you study, you'll see that I'm <clears throat> you'll see what I'm talking about. It's taught all throughout, it's taught all through the Holy Scriptures. They keep referring back to this. If someone asks, what is that goal? I would say farming. <laughs> Okay, you hear that? Farming. I know some would laugh if I said so, but that's exactly what it is. It's farming or tilling the land. Okay, tilling the land. So why is farming important? Food, right? Food. It's very important. Food is very important. But is Father Yahweh only talking about the physical food? He's not. Right. And that's what's so important. And that's what we have to consider as we pay close attention to the rest of this sermon. Remember, one of the scriptures says that um, says you are the tillage of Yahweh. Remember that scripture? 
Y'all don't remember that scripture? First Corinthians three. Nine. Nine. Three, eight, three, nine. All right. I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, but in first Corinthians three, eight or three, nine, it says, for you are the tillage of Yahweh. Right. Who knows what it means to till? To till, like to till the land. To prepare it, right? To prepare it for growth, right? So that you can plant things so that things can grow. You are the tillage of Yahweh. Yahweh refers to us like trees sometimes. Uh, he refers to us, uh, remember, it says they will spring up like, uh, what is it, willows, spring up as gra- grass uh, or as willows by the water courses or something like that. But Yahweh refers to us in these, these different, um, as these different things to show that we're beneficial to support life, right? Remember a tree of life, right? Right? In the Garden of Eden, Yahweh says that you could partake in the tree of life. In Psalms 1, it says that a, 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 a righteous man is like a tree planted by rivers of water. Yeshua said that a righteous tree bears what? Righteous fruit, right? And so the very first instructions was partake in this tree. You can eat from this tree, right? These teachers. So we should already be thinking about the, what is it? Uh, the, the Deuteronomy to the, to the Timothy. Remember that? Find knowledgeable and trustworthy men to guard and keep this way. But what pastor started off with here in, in verse two was the sicknesses, the diseases, and the wars because they're not following the instructions that was given to mankind from the very beginning, right? Remember, the goal was given to mankind in the first two chapters, right? Creation is in chapter one, right? And then Genesis chapter two, one, what's the first verse? What does it talk about? The Sabbath day, right? Meeting with Yahweh on the Sabbath day to receive these instructions so that we can learn how to guard and keep this way. So look at, um, let's turn to Proverbs chapter one, because remember, we just read here, pastor said in the bottom of verse seven, he's talking about farming. It says, I know some of you will laugh if I said so, but that's exactly what it is. It's farming or tilling the land. And we are the tillage of Yahweh. So in Proverbs chapter one, let's take a look at, uh, we'll start in verse, just verse one, because again, we're not just talking about physical food, which is extremely important, but also the spiritual food, Right. The, 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 the members in Yahweh's house that's going to actually bring forth the words, the doctrine of life that's going to sustain life throughout all of the universe, throughout all of eternity. So Proverbs chapter one, verse verse one, it says the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David. King of Israel it says for uh, for attaining education and wisdom and moral discipline to comprehend words of understanding for acquiring training and discernment of wisdom justice, judgment, and equity, to give subtly, to sharpen the wits, teach discernment and common sense to the simple, untutored, and ignorant, to give knowledge and discretion to the youth. The wise and educated scholar also can hear and increase his store of knowledge, and a man of understanding can receive sound guidance for the cultivation of the mind. Did you see that right there? Cultivation of the mind to prepare the mind so that something can grow. Right. Preparing the mind. So if you know about farming, you'll see why it's important, you know, to understand these things. If you know about farming, you'll see that you have to know the conditions of the land before you try to plant something. OK, because like if you go straight into like the a, a, a desert and try to plant like an apple tree. What do you think is going to occur? Probably nothing, right? See, it'll be burnt up, right? So you have to prepare the land for something to grow. And so here, this is for the cultivation of the mind, right? So can you cultivate your mind and and get it ready for the way of Yahweh on Sunday, on Christmas, Halloween, Easter? No, you can't, okay? You cannot do these things. Yahweh says, meet with him on the Sabbath day and at his feast days, you know, prepare your mind to receive the information so that we can do our jobs because he has a goal for us. Continuing on here, it says, for the cultivation of the mind and training in ethical principles by the use of proverbs, mashal, parables and warnings, melizah, sayings of the sages, debris hakamim, and their riddles and puzzling questions, hedah. Then he says that the reverence of Yahweh is the beginning 
The first requirement, the chief part of knowledge and wisdom. Only fools, morally perverse, turning from what is right, despise wisdom and instruction. Okay, so what is right? We haven't covered that in a long time. So what is right? The laws of Yahweh. Psalms. I heard it somewhere in the back. Psalms 33, 4. The laws of Yahweh are right and all of his works are done in truth. But the Psalms 119 wasn't wrong either, though, but praise Yahweh. So, okay, so we have the cultivation of the mind, the being the tillage of Yahweh, getting his physical food ready, as well as people prepared to present the spiritual food. So pastor goes on in the next few verses, and he talks about Ariel Sharon and how he was, uh, he was a farm boy and how he wanted to continue in that way of life, but he was pulled into the fighting. He had to fight, but he said that he wanted to continue to be a farm boy. Okay, because it was a peaceful way of life, right? Raising things up and then being close to the family, okay? Being a family unit and doing these things. And he goes on to show how, you know, our, our peace, our, uh, the, the peace that we want in our homes is easily taken away without the, the laws of Yahweh being kept. You know, it's, it's something as simple as, not simple, but something like your, your neighbor coming into your yard and, and, and taking something of yours or your, uh, the, the country's warring or, or even a child being born with, with, a, with a disease. All of these are various ways that our peace can be taken from us. Okay, and again, that's because of, of not having the laws of Yahweh in every aspect of our lives. So pastor goes on here. And he was talking about, um, again, more children being born with STDs and how they're expanding the, the state school because of the confusion that's, that's being bred into our children. And, and then the, um, the amount of crime that's being produced by these, by, by these children and things like that. And he goes on, he talks about how the family unit, you know, requires both the father and the mother. And a lot of these children that they were putting into the, uh, the state school were, were children whose fathers were not around, right? Whose fathers were not around because of the, the unlawful relationships that, that's, uh, that's going on in the world. And so one of the scriptures that and I'm thinking about it was um, it talks about an infidel. You're, you're, you're worse than an infidel if you don't provide for those of your own house. What is that? Timothy, right? First Timothy? I think that's First Timothy. But it says that you're worse than an infidel if you don't take care of the, the, the needs of those who are in your own house, right? And that's what's taking place in the world today. The, the family unit is so messed up, so dysfunctional that they were, you know, the children are growing up in, in single family households and it takes both the mother and the father to raise the children. That's the way that Yahweh set it up. OK, so we have those issues going on here. And then Pastor goes on. I'm going to turn over to page 234 here, 236 rather. And Pastor goes on and he talks about how um, the people are going to and fro. They're going to and fro just like Satan did, searching for something. OK, and he says here in verse verse 20. What they're actually craving is what Yahweh offers, which is peace, joy, and true love, not illegal lust. They don't even realize that. They think what they're actually craving will be fulfilled in the next, um, the next unlawful relationship, whether it's a man or a woman. But it says that their, their minds are so corrupt that they're not going to have, you know, this, this desire filled. But it says they've never found the peace that Yahweh offers. And I was at the top of verse 21 there. They never found the peace that Yahweh is offering. Here in the middle of verse 22, it says, he said, it's obvious that the world would be better off. He's talking about a, uh, an official who, who was saying that um, we, should, we should kill, you know, we should abort the children and, and, the, and the people who are doing certain things, we should just kill them, putting it into the minds of the people that we should just start murdering others okay we should start murdering others but then pastor says that you know this is just another form of of hatred and they still are, are putting Yahweh's way to the side okay and so I need to switch gears here um, and start talking about the goals that Yahweh has for us okay so remember what we just covered there okay Remember what we just covered. Pastor wanted us to understand the, the wars, the sickness, the disease, 
how we're bringing these things down to the children, how um, we're not going to find the peace that we want, the, the, the peaceful way of living that we want outside of what Yahweh is offering. And he said that the kingdom of priests, this is what we're going to be learning in Yahweh's house, how to have that true peace and that true joy, right? And what did he say? Um, how did he say it here? He said that, he said that the, let's see, let's see, let's see. What's the goal for mankind? What did Pastor say the goal for mankind was? He said it would be what? What is it? Farming. Okay, just wanted to make sure we was all on the same page here. Farming. Farming, growing food, right? So look at verse 26 here. It says, turn over to Genesis chapter 1. And I'm going to speed up just a little bit. Yahweh shows you here what he had to put up with to begin with. The wars, the sickness, the breeding of the diseases in the children, okay? So Yahweh shows you what he had to put up with to begin with. And why he said, I'm going to create man in my image, and I'm going to make them a kingdom of priests. And those priests are going to teach what is found here in the first three chapters of Genesis. They are, these are the whole job, the whole jobs and goals. They've gotten away from that. And he's talking about the, the mankind, how we've gotten away from what Yahweh created us for. Remember in Genesis chapter one, he shows creation. In Genesis chapter two, he shows the Sabbath day meeting with him. And then he also gives some warning because remember the four rivers uh, uh, that came out of um, Eden is shown in, in Genesis chapter two also. But then in Genesis chapter three, he shows the deception becoming evil like the gods. OK, so consider that as we continue to go on there. So those are in the first three chapters of Genesis in a nutshell. Then look at down, look at uh, 28. It says in the beginning, Yahweh created the heavens. And he says that it took billions and billions of years to create the heavens and his own sons were with them. But they turned because of illegal lusts. OK, things that they wanted. And in verse 29, Yahweh wanted a great example to show to all the universe what would take place without his laws. He's showing just what they're doing with the tiny earth that they're working with, right? The tiny earth that they're working with. Go to verse 32. Now, after Yahweh created the earth, the earth became without form and empty and, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Okay, and again, that, uh, that word darkness means to be led astray because of false doctrine, right? To be led astray because of false doctrine. Down in 36, he gives a, a more in-depth definition of the word darkness. It means stupidity. Okay, stupidity was upon the face of the deep, covering the whole earth. The word darkness means misery, death, destruction, ignorance, wickedness, and sorrow. And he says, what else could you name? What else could you name that the world is going through? What else can you name it, right? But then he goes on and he talks about the various days of in creation, how um, Yahweh said, let there be seed bearing plants and trees, which shows uh, their, their flowers and blossoms and, and blooms. Then he goes on and, uh, and down in verse uh, 41, created the sea creatures, the birds, down in 43, let's see, 44. He says, um, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to its kind, the cattle and all of the, all of the things with which the earth creeps. And then Yahweh saw that it was right. And then he said, I will create mankind. OK, and here's his here's important part. He said, I'll create mankind. And he says he's going to put us over all of these things. So at the top of page 38, look at 238. Look at verse 47. OK. It says people learn less about what it takes People learn less about what makes life than they do about everything else. They learn about television sets, automobiles, how to make money, and how to play, and how to literally waste their time with entertainment. So he's showing that if we don't take our calling seriously and actually learn what it takes to serve Yahweh, then we're part of the problem, right? One of the great cons reminded me of what pastor said years ago. He said that if we don't diligently teach our children, then we're sending curses out into the world. Okay? We're sending curses out into the world. If we don't train to become like Yahweh, then we're a curse in the world. And we were curses in the world before we came to Yahweh's house. 
then that's how important this information is. But then Pastor goes on and he continues to explain here how we have to subdue the earth, you know, be fruitful and multiply, multiply and subdue it. And that word subdue down in verse 54 means to learn it so that you can teach it to others. OK, and that takes effort. We have to learn how to teach this information to guard and to keep this way of Yahweh. But look back up to verse 51, because it says here that Yahweh showed Adam and Eve and said, you have to learn this and you have to guard it. This is your religion. When you do this, you're worshiping me and serving me. You're becoming my true, loyal and trusted servants when you do this. OK, you're becoming my true. You're becoming my true, loyal and trusted servants when you do this. And an infidel, if you look at it, the definition of infidel, and I think it's in Timothy, but it says an infidel is not trustworthy. He's not loyal. He's not true. OK, but when we serve Yahweh in this capacity, when we learn, learn to guard and keep Yahweh's way, he says, you are true. You are loyal. You are trustworthy. Right. And again, remember the, the, the Deuteronomy to the Timothy. Right. Becoming knowledgeable, wise and trustworthy men, you know, to, to guard this information. So with that, I want you to add to your notes, Romans, uh, Romans 3, 2, Romans 3, 2. And then I'm going to turn it over to the Kahan here. Romans 3, 2. Because we are talking about being trusted, right? Being trusted by Yahweh. In Romans 3, 2, it says, Much in every way, chiefly because to them were entrusted the very words of Yahweh, right? Being trusted with the words of Yahweh. And remember, these are not just idle words, but these laws mean what? These are the words of life, right? These are the words of life. And Yahweh has to trust us with these things. Right. Life. This is a plan for life. This is the food of Yahweh, the food for spirit holy. Right. We have to cultivate our minds and learn how to, you know, grow this food. We have to be grown the tillage of Yahweh. Right. People can partake in the words that we speak and Yahweh gives them permission as long as we're speaking in unity with this doctrine. So be trusted with these words, man. Yahweh bless your understanding. If you all please stand trumpet to the great God, Betsy Leo Hawkins. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. <clears throat> Yahweh's peace be with each and every one of you. Please be seated. Okay, we are in the fifth book of Israel, <clears throat> chapter 28. <clears throat> I'll be picking up on page 239, verse 61. Now here, pastor is bringing forth the word support. That is body support or life support. Now, when you think of the body, you can, it can refer to your personal body, but also in a spiritual sense, in this context, it also applies to the whole body of Messiah, all of the called out ones, the body of believers. And remember that the first law is to believe in Yahweh as the only source of power in the universe. It means position that Yahweh is offering you also. So when we go through these lessons and, and hear pastor's instructions, we need to continually remind ourselves to keep the bigger picture in mind. That's what the word meant when he told Adam and Eve he was going to give them authority over this. He said, hold it and not let go, he said to continue and hold it and not let it go, don't spoil it, but to, to guard it, to shelter it, to protect it, um, and to continue in that. Now, in the Peaceful Solution, we learned that once you learn and establish a positive course of action and you continue in that, uh, faithfully and continually, that's called integrity. And so this is our goal. This is what we want to strive for. And the, the first best place to do that is within ourselves because we come here to learn, correct? To, who came here to teach? Well, we have to work up to that, don't we? First we learn what to teach, and then we teach what we've learned once we are, are given the 
permission or authorization to do so. And remember, any time we open our mouths in the presence of others, we're teaching by example, either positive or negative. Do all of this, that is, if you will do them, right? Yahweh admonished us, if you will do these things, then you will achieve these positive results. If you do these other things, which are negative, you will bring upon yourselves the negative uh, consequences of that. Do all of this, which means you can maintain peace if you have healthy minds and bodies to work with, if you don't defile them and bring in confusion. And we've talked about this previously, but uh, science knows there's certain parasites that can enter into the body, into the brain, and if, which, you know, parasites, we typically think of them entering the digestive tract. But we know now that there's a connection between the mind and the gut, correct? So some of these parasites reside in the gut, some reside in the brain. But we've got scientific proof and evidence now. It's easy to find articles that show us how these parasites actually influence the thinking of the host that they're in. And by the same account, those parasites and microbes that reside in the gut can also affect the thinking because it's, it's all a feedback system. <clears throat> by feedback, I mean one action results in uh, an effect or a consequence, and that consequence results in uh, influencing what started that action. That might not be too clear, but if you, for example, if you make a choice to steal and then you get caught and you're remorseful, you feel guilt. And because you feel guilty, then you might express sorrow or regret. And then you're told there's going to be a consequence and then you have to deal with that. So it's a feedback system. Your action produced a result that fed back to you, either positive or negative, and that influences your next action. Now, if you're humble and submissive, as Yahweh teaches us to be, you take that correction and are uh, better off for it. You receive that instruction, you change, you repent, you change your ways, you then choose to make better choices next time, and that becomes a positive feedback loop. Positive feedback uh, increases uh, strength and energy. Negative feedback reduces and, and tears down. First Yachanon, 1 verse 1. In the beginning was this plan. The plan was to support life and to even have everlasting life. So remember, keep the larger picture in mind here because... Um, in Isaiah 25, there's a, a footnote, I notice. Now, we suffer afflictions. We all do. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's common uh, in our lives, but it's for a purpose also. Okay, Isaiah 25. Now, this is uh, verse 20. This is... Uh, Come, my people, enter into my sanctuary, and I'll shut the doors around you. There's a, a, uh, a suggestion, a, a uh, implication of protection here, but that's the context of that. But the side note here says, He exhorts the faithful to be patient in their afflictions and to wait upon Yahweh's work. To wait upon Yahweh's work. Well, what is the bigger picture? What is the purpose of Yahweh's work? It's to bring forth Go ahead, anyone. What is the purpose of Yahweh's work? All of that to bring forth everlasting righteousness, to bring an end to sin, to bring an end to sickness, disease, death, and suffering. And so we, we can see that as the bigger picture, the purpose for Yahweh's work. But in our afflictions, you know, that can seem to take a long time. We're looking for deliverance. We call upon the priest for prayer. We want to be healed. But do you see, it's more than just our personal interests or our personal needs. The, the bigger picture is 
all of creation, all of mankind, and all of the beings that Yahweh created, so that while we endure our afflictions, we remain faithful in the hope that ultimately Yahweh's work, which we support and uphold, will fulfill its uh, its goal, its its purpose, to finally bring an end to the sickness, disease, suffering, and death that we've all endured and suffered uh, with. And in Isaiah 26, verse 3, remember we're in this idea or this context of this plan to support life and even have everlasting life. The goals of the world are something different, right? In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Yada. We have a strong city. Yahweh will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates so the righteous body of people who keep the truth may enter, will enter in, shall enter in. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed or steadfast on you, Yahweh, because he trusts in you, Yahweh. Now it says, in that day. Back in Isaiah 24, we see the context of this. Behold, Yahweh, uh, before Yahweh's very eyes, the earth is made empty and is made waste. And you know the rest of that. You can read that in its corrected translation. But you can see here that it's in the greatest time of trouble where mankind is bringing this destruction upon himself. The goals of the world are illegal lust, excitement, play, foolish tranquility. I had to think about that one a moment. Stupidity and ignorance. Foolish tranquility. Well, um, you know, the world today, it's not not all negative appearing but you know people will seek this peace and relaxation but without the laws of Yahweh it, it appears um, peaceful and and nice on the on the surface but they're trying to achieve these things without the laws of peace and so that's why that, that's what I took from this word foolish tranquility you know, people want to be tranquil and peaceful, but if it's if it's sought without or outside the laws of Yahweh, outside the laws of peace, it's not going to be everlasting. At this point, he brings up the word preservation. Uh, back in verse 57, the word keep, meaning to observe, also meaning to guard, to protect, to tend, and preserve it. So it means... But we're continuing on this word, um, giving a further explanation, meaning preservation. Carrying on from keep. The apostles knew what they were, okay. So in the interest of this, Ilya was, the prophet Ilya was given a job to do. And... When, when you see these things in the scripture, just a, a simple statement's made, you know, and it, it seems like a really simple thing. But in 1 Samuel 19.20, uh, he observed the school of the prophets. There's a lot that goes along with that. Well, a school, what are they doing there? How did they get there? Who are they? You know, what is their purpose? So there's, there's a lot of detail to fill in. You know, the Holy Scriptures... Um, they cover thousands of years of man's history. You know, if, if you were going to write a book just about your life, let's say you're over the age of uh, 40 or 50, if you were to try to write all the details of your life, you know, if you could even recall them, how big would that library be? You, know, you can't put every single detail. So what would Yahweh put in a book? 
to carry over to this generation. You see, there's got to be a lot more there than what first meets the eye. And, and we'll cover some of that here if I speed along here and get to it. Hebrews 10.39. But we are not of those who draw back, as we see what the world has done today, drawing back into perdition. He created man, remember, for the purpose of learning his laws. Now, if you don't believe this, you will in these coming two years. And Yahweh willing, at the end of this uh, sermon, there's a reference to this again. And looking in the news today, we hear about the troubles. We heard about it today in the sermons, uh, the things on the news, the things that are increasing and and growing worse and worse upon mankind. And something he draws our attention to is that when you do watch the news and you see these advertisements, you know, they're not for no reason. When these advertisements come out for pain medication and, and uh, other drugs to treat uh, bad conditions, you know, very uncomfortable posi- uh, conditions for people, It's, it's extremely profitable for them to do that because there are so many people actually suffering these things. But then they, they cover it up with these drugs and then go on with their life, continuing in their ignorance because they have no teacher uh, and they have no ears to hear at this time. But they will. It's coming. People don't keep these diseases to themselves either. Most people don't even know they have them, so they can end up spreading them to others unawares. Continuing in verse 75 now, in Hebrews 10.22. Now, here, Pastor uh, makes reference to the true translation of this. And let's see, did I... I think I can, oh, I know where it is. If you look in the third book of Israel, chapter 5, he goes into great detail of Hebrews 10.22. But in the interest of time, I'm going to just give you the, the conclusion of this. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of the faith, having been sprinkled, separating our hearts from the knowledge of evil and our bodies cleansed by water of the ashes of the red heifer. And he explains here in the um, third book of Israel, chapter 5, where this translation came from. And you can uh, ponder that in your studies more closely. Verse 23, let us hold fast to the confession of our faith. We just got through seeing this word means preserving life. You remember the the bigger picture of the faith is the whole plan of salvation for preserving life. Now he picks up on the word dress. This was given in the Garden of Eden to dress and keep, and it means to worship, to worship, to serve, in any sense of the form, or to till. So we see this Hebrew word abad, from which we get the English word dress, also includes these meanings. And now we pick up in the storyline here, Abel and Cain. Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And Yahweh uses these um, metaphors throughout the scripture, this word tiller is the same word as dress. Hebrews 11.4, by the faith, Abel offered to Yahweh a more excellent sacrifice. Now, what is Yahweh truly concerned with here? Is it a physical sacrifice? Or is it our actions and behavior? 
And this is where the commentators have twisted this translation up. But as Pastor goes on to point out in verse 83, it's not talking about what they brought. It's talking about what was in them, right? What one came to teach and the other one didn't. So, so this is really where the true value is in a teacher. And this is what can be in our youngest, our most inexperienced uh, people. If they will learn the instruction of Yahweh, the things that will truly help themselves and others, and then they can teach that to others. Now you have true, added true value to your life. Because that's the purpose for what you, you were created. Cain was traveling to and fro, hunting excitement. So it was his lifestyle that was displeasing to Yahweh because Yahweh could see the end result, the hurt and the harm uh, that would come to him as a result of this and all those he taught by example and, and in other ways because then the same thing would come upon them too. Continuing in the word abad, it means servant, to work, to worship. It's learning Yahweh's way and being able and willing to guard this and teach it throughout all eternity, which means teaching it to your children. And once again, I reiterate, the best way is by your example, showing them how you do it, and then they will follow by that example. He who worships Yahweh, he who farms according to the laws of the scriptures, he who raises cattle according to the laws of agriculture, he who worships according to Yahweh's laws. If you farm or raise chickens, if you raise them according to Yahweh's laws, you worship Yahweh. So really everything we do in our lives according to Yahweh's laws, keeping our, our behavior, our actions lawful, is worshiping and serving Yahweh. It's a whole lifestyle. Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction will be consumed in the fire. A righteous man receives honor from Yahweh. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she who causes shame. Now what would result in shame? What would a woman do that would bring shame. Well, if we look back to verse 84, we see as Cain traveling to and fro, hunting excitement, and partaking in a worldly lifestyle. What we see today is a worldly lifestyle. Exposing yourself to the influences. Starting to think like they do. Remember the sister that brought a sermon uh, some time ago, several months ago, I think, that said that, you know, our behavior is portrayed to others. And, and if we look like, and I think the emphasis was, you know, don't do these things that remind others of the world or put the sight of the world in their thoughts or their minds. Don't look like them. Don't act like them. Don't, you know, behave this way. He who causes the upright to go astray in an evil way, he will fall into his own pit, but the upright will have a righteous possession. So what he's showing here is that the way of the world uh, has an end result, and the wise can see this and, and uh, predict this, you know, and s steer away from that. And notice in verse 103, you know, once we come to this knowledge of the, the right way to live, the correct way, and we, we need a path for repentance, and the path and the pattern that Yahweh has established for us in the house of Yahweh is to go to the priest. He who conceals his sins will not be blessed, but he who confesses 
and forsakes or repents of them will have mercy and be rewarded for it. And, and you know, the reward is one thing. It's getting the weight of sin off of you and then freeing you up to go forward and to overcome and to build strength, to, and build, to build that positive character and integrity in your life. So we still had a ways to go yet, but you know this is how it goes with these sermons. But I, um, there, there's a lot of detail and, and length here. But um, I'll leave you with, uh, with this uh, to remember how and why Yahweh created you, and it gets back to the basics of life, and these are things that we cannot live without. And where will it end? If you look on page 243, there's a an excerpt from the Prophetic Word newsletter, and this is absolutely timely with what we are experiencing here in this last three-and-a-half-year time frame. Yahweh, bless your understanding and bless the remainder of your Sabbath. Thank you all for coming. If you'll please stand, we'll rise and, and give thanks and praise to Yahweh. Our great and awesome Father, whose name is Yahweh, this is Kohan Betzalel, coming before you as the seed of the witness Israel, and through uh, our most honorable Ahab, high priest and king over the house of Yahweh, Yahshua Messiah. We thank you and bless you, Father Yahweh, for the teaching and instruction that comes forth and the great wisdom of our overseer that you have trained and, and put in him, Father Yahweh, all these years to be a blessing to us. And we thank you for this um, Opportunity. We pray for your continued inspiration, your help and guidance. We pray for your healing and protection of, upon the laborers and that you would um, help us in our ability to remain patient, to be steadfast uh, in the long-suffering and the, uh, the things that are coming upon the earth. We pray that we'd uh, be strong, faithful, and not fearful in these things, but hoping and trusting in your prophecies, and your instruction, your laws. We thank you and praise you for all these things and give you thanks and praise and unity as a body of priests through the last day's witnesses, Rahakins, and through and by the authority of our high priest, Yahshua Messiah. Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh.